Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Oh, give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Oh, keep me burning till the break of day. Oh, fill my life with your love, fill my life with your love, keep me glowing. Oh, give me. With your love, I pray. Oh, fill my life with your love. Keep me glowing, glowing, glowing. Keep me glowing till the break of day. Oh, sing, Hosanna. Sing, Hosanna. Sing, Hosanna to the King. Oh, sing, Hosanna. so glad I'm a part oh, of the family of God. Oh, I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. I'm a joint heir with Jesus as we travel this side. I'm part of the family, the family of God and you may notice we say brother and sister around here it's because we're a family and these folks are so dear and when one has a heartache we all share the tear and rejoice family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. I'm cleansed by His blood. I'm a joint heir with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the doors of an orphan to the house of the king, I'm no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. Oh, from rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy.
bless you this evening. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege of standing once again in your divine presence, Lord, because we know that you keep all of your appointments and we know that you are here for you promised wherever two or three are gathered in your name that you'll be here in our midst. So as we stand in our presence, Lord, we may, may we give you the reverence and the honor that you deserve. May we surrender ourselves to you and give you the preeminence that you're seeking in this day. And may you take this vessel that's behind this pulpit under your control, Lord, for I yield myself to you and I ask that you would speak what you have, what you have a desire to speak tonight. May you deliver unto your children that portion that you reserve for this special time. And God, I pray that you anoint us to receive it, Lord, it's from you. May we take it and may it become part of us, Lord. May it change us. We give, give you preeminence. We surrender to you. We ask that you would speak with freedom and liberty, Lord, as we exalt your name. We love you. We thank you for this opportunity we have once again to hear your word preached. We ask these things that you'd bless these things and all that we do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you while we're standing. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 3. Amen. While you're turning, uh, I, I'll let you know that Brother Vernon and Sister Irene made it home safely. They sent us a text this morning. They made it back home, and they thank everybody for your warm welcome and hospitality, and we sure enjoyed the service this past Sunday. Amen. Really learned a lot. Amen. I'm going to read one scripture here out of Acts chapter 3. And I'd like to read from uh, verse 19, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Amen. God bless you as you have your seats. Amen. I'd like to speak on a subject this evening of repent and be converted. Amen. Amen. Repent and be converted. Amen. I... I um, I've been meditating on this, and it just keeps coming and coming over the last two, three days. I actually, I sat down, and I got some inspiration. I started working on a thought, and I was jotting it down really fast, and I thought I was going to go that direction, and, and this was part of it. But uh, as I sat down today, more and more and more started coming. And so, like I say so many times, I don't want to blow through it. I'm going to slow down, and I'm going to take just this part, amen, tonight, amen. We don't have any visitors coming that I know of for a while, so I can take the services as I... I can take my time, amen, and uh, we can take this over the next service or two, however it comes. But I want to talk about repent and be converted, and the reason I want to go into this is because so many times we use terms, and because we've grown up in a Christian culture and around a Christian society, even if we didn't grow up in the message, it was still in a Christian society of sorts, we use terms, and I think uh, uh, from the abundance of use, sometimes they lose meaning or the meaning gets muddled, amen? 
And so I don't want to, I, I don't want that to be the case. I want to understand what it means to be repent and be converted because that's the commandment that was given uh, by Peter, repent and be converted. And so we're going to look at those terms and then we're going to look at the things that Brother Branham taught and then we'll move from there. Let's go back now to Acts chapter 2, verse 37. This is the familiar inaugural address of the New Testament church at the day of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, he says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is amazing. Uh, this is a promise that's been given to us if we'll repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Brother Branham said, if you truly repent and are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and do not receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it makes God a liar. So we just take him at his word and believe that God will honor his word if we truly repent and are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, and then we shall receive it and we just receive it as a gift from God and say, God, I'm open to receiving your gift and God will fulfill his word in our lives. So when we talk about repent here, when we look at this passage of scripture, I, I, I've talked about this before, but who is, it's important to know that who is Peter addressing? Because Peter is not addressing prostitutes. He's not addressing drug dealers. He's not uh, addressing uh, Roman centurions or Roman officials or Roman citizens or Greeks. Amen. Th this is the Feast of Pentecost. And in the Feast of Pentecost, the devout Jews from all over the world, and it lists here how many nations heard them speaking in their own tongues. So we know that we have a record of Jews gathering from all around the world and all these nations. Why are they coming back? Because they believe the word of God. They believe what Moses taught, amen. They're, they're coming back in obedience to what Moses had taught to the prophet that was before, amen. And they're coming back. So these are, these are good church members, let's say. They're not staying back in their country. They're coming according to what was commanded in Moses. They're returning back at the Feast of Pentecost because there was three times in the year that every male in Israel must report to Jerusalem to present himself before the Lord. Amen. And it was the Feast of, uh, of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, right? So now these, the, this group that were here, amen, when they spilled out of the upper room, amen, speaking in tongues, all these Jews heard them in their own language because they had gathered to the Feast of Pentecost because they were worshipers and believers of the Bible. So this is the ones who asked Peter, what should we do? And Peter says, repent. Repent, first repent. And so... When, when, when growing up all my life, I used to think of repentance, because I grew up in Pentecostal churches, I thought repentance was uh, saying I'm sorry for wrong deeds. But that's not exactly what repentance is. That, that's asking forgiveness, and asking forgiveness is not the same as repentance, right? And so I, I wrote this down so I wouldn't lose track of it. I said, uh, asking forgiveness is to ask someone to release or pardon you for doing wrong. That's to ask forgiveness. So when I, when I begin to express my remorse and regret for my wrong deeds, I'm asking God to forgive me, amen, I'm asking him to pardon me or to release me. If I ask forgiveness from somebody else, I'm asking them to pardon me or release me, amen, from doing a wrong deed, amen? But that's not what repentance is because this word repentance that's used here in Acts chapter two and then the first verse we opened with when he said, repent ye therefore and be converted. This word in the Greek means to change one's mind. Yeah. Yeah. To change one's mind. And so you can see how repentance is different than asking for forgiveness because you can ask for forgiveness, amen, but you're just sorry for doing wrong, but unless your mind changes, you're going to repeat the offense. But repentance is a changing of your thinking concerning the offense. So, so asking forgiveness is, is uh, saying you're sorry, asking for a pardon or a release for wrongdoing, but repentance is actually changing, changing your thinking about the wrongdoing. And repentance actually prevents you from repeating because your whole understanding, your whole thinking about it has changed. 
So now he comes to, uh, uh, on the day of Pentecost, and now these devout Jews, they stand up. Uh, they're, they're there. They're hearing them. And, and he's telling them, what must he do? You must repent. You've got to change what you think about God. You've got to change your understanding. You must repent. Amen. You think this is false. You think this is a call. You think this is uh, some work of a man. You've got to change all your thinking. You didn't understand who Jesus was. You didn't understand who John the Baptist was. You didn't even understand really what Moses was teaching. Amen. Because it, it, what, what began to prick their heart? What, when their hearts were pricked, what was their hearts pricked over? Because Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and began connecting Old Testament scripture to modern events. I, like I said before, he was preaching modern events made clear by prophecy. Amen. He kept saying what Joel said. This is what you're seeing is what Joel said. Amen. And this is what David said. And this resurrection was referred back to when David said, he'll not leave my soul in hell. Amen. Neither shall my holy one see corruption. And he begins to tie all the Old Testament promises to the present day. Amen. What's he doing? Amen. He's disrupting their whole understanding of what they knew about their religion, what they knew about their faith. And then their heart was pricked. He said, what we do? Repent. He wasn't say, telling them, stop drinking, stop smoking. Stop the prostitution and stop the killing. That wasn't what this repentance was. This repentance was, you've got to change your understanding. You've got to change your thinking. We've been seeing this all wrong. And then repent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because if you change your understanding of who Christ was, you can get baptized in his name. Amen. You can be baptized in his name and for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you can see how, Brother Branham said, a true repentance is necessary for this promise. Because you can see how um, you can see how you could even baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, but have the wrong understanding Amen. and not receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because it takes repentance, a change of mind, and then baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the pattern. This is the method. So let's go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And I'm going to use two examples out of the scripture to show you how repentance is, is a change of mind. Acts chapter 8, verse 18. He says, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter saith unto him, Thy money perisheth with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. What was wrong with Simon? Simon had the complete wrong understanding. And he, was, he says, the wickedness in your heart, and repent that the wickedness in your heart may be forgiven. He had the complete wrong understanding. So let's go to the, the next one, then uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Said, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. He's, he's finding them in ignorant worship, but now he's going to declare this one that they don't understand. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. 
and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God has is like unto gold or silver or stone graven with art and man's device. See, what's Paul doing? Paul's starting to tear away all their understanding about God. Their idolatry and their multiple God worship and, and making up, setting up stones and statues and all of this to represent God. He's talking about all that. Then he goes to verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Amen. Amen. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Paul now coming to the Gentiles since Mars Hill, amen, the great place of philosophy and discussion, and, and they had so much uh, talk, and they, they had a, a worship of multiple gods, and they had idolatry, and he begins to explain all this, but he says, amen, you were ignorantly worshiping this uh, unknown God. I come to declare him to you, amen, because you don't have any understanding, amen, and ignorantly you began to worship with stones and man-made objects and all of these things. He said, which ignorance God winked at? for a time, but not anymore. Now he's calling you to repentance. Now you have to change all your understanding, whatever you thought you knew about God, all the philosophy and all the understanding. Now that the message has come, you have to repent from all of that and you have to believe the message that Paul is preaching. Amen. 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 That's what Paul says. He says, I'll read 30 again. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth men everywhere to repent. God's not going to let it be okay anymore. Now the truth is coming. Amen. You must repent from that and accept the truth. Amen. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Why do you have to repent? Because there's coming a judgment day. And now that the truth has come, you're held accountable. Now you must repent. Amen. Let's go to Acts 26 now. Acts 26, verse 19. This is where we're going to get our first glimpse of be converted. Because we read the opening scripture says, uh, repent ye therefore and be converted. So this is a commandment to repent and be converted. Right? And so here we find this word in Acts 26, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So this word repent is the word we've been talking about to change your mind. This word turn is the same word that's used, converted, almost everywhere else in the Bible. So repent and be converted or turn to God. Amen. And so we're going to look at this even more specifically because Brother Bram gives us more information and, and so does the Bible. Uh, Brother Frank, if you could pull up the whiteboard, I'm going to go to the whiteboard in just a minute. Go to John chapter 12 with me while we turn. I forgot to tell you to keep your Bibles handy. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures, but I think you figured that out by now. I haven't given you a chance to put them down. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and let's go to verse 39. John 12 and 39. Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. So you can see how understanding leads to conversion. Let's read again so we understand because you're to repent and be converted. Repent means to change your thinking. So he's telling us that their eyes were blinded and their understanding darkened so that they could not 
convert. So that they could not repent and they could not be converted. So I read it again. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted. So if they would see with their eyes and understand with their heart, then they would be converted. So if they were able to repent, they could be converted. Amen. You can see how even in repentance, it's going to take a revelation from God because you're not going to be able to change your own thinking unless God gives a revelation. So it's going to take a work of God even to bring you to repentance. And if God gives you eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand, then you have the ability to repent, to change your understanding and to be converted. Hallelujah. I like that. So I'm going to write down these words just so we have them right out of the Greek. Repent. The concordance says to change one's mind and then to convert or to be converted. To turn to. Now, this is an interesting word to turn to. In the in the scripture that we read before in Acts, that they would be uh, repent and turn to God. This word that is is translated converted, the one that we're going to be using. Uh, it, that this Greek word is not just to turn, not like a random turning, like you just turn any direction you want, but it's actually a specific turning. It's turning to a position or turning to a destination, and, and I'm going to explore more of that, but it's very, very specific because there's another word that's just to turn. You can just turn this way and you can turn that way, but this word is a specific turning, a turning to. It's also used as to, to cause to return or to bring back. And it also means to revert. So I already hear some people saying amen. You can always see the truth, amen. The message has opened our eyes. It's not just turning, randomly turning, but you're turning to something, turning back, amen? And you turn to God, amen? Many times in the Bible, it's, it, it's used to turn, but it's always something specific, to turn unto the Lord. But many, many times, it's mean to turn back again, to, to, to turn back around and talk to who you were talking with before. I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples. Let's go to Luke chapter two. We're going to look at the same exact word. The Greek word is epistrepho. I know that sounds fancy, but ep epistrepho, because there's another word that means converted, it's just strepho, that just means turn. But epi is like epicenter, it's a specific place. Amen. So it's epistrepho, turn specifically or turn to. Amen. So that, that it's really important that we understand that. Well, I'm not just throwing out Greek words just to sound smart because I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. So. But there's a real reason behind it. So, so Acts, or Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 19. It says, um, And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned. Guess what? That's epistepho. Same word that means Converted and be converted. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's go to, let's go to Luke 22. I'm sorry, not Luke. I don't want to go to Luke 22. I want to go to 1 Peter 2. But we're going to come back to Luke, so save your space in Luke. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm not going to go to a bunch of places. There's, there's several more, but I'm just going to show this so we can see it in the Scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. It says, For you were sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. 
So have you figured it out? The word returned is the word converted. It's the same word that's translated converted in other places or turned to, it's, 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 convert, it's, it's translated returned, amen? Or turn about or return again, amen? Even Jesus, when he went to pray for the 12-year-old little girl, Jairus' little girl, amen, and he prayed for her, her spirit came again. This word came again is epistephos. She came back again. So you can see there's a whole uh, uh, usage in this word of to return or to turn back or to turn or, or, or to, to revert, amen? And that's going to be really important, amen, because converting, uh, being converted may not be turning back, to, turning to something new, but it may be turning back to something yeah. previous, amen? Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 Verse 31. In Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31, he says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that you may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. We know that here Peter a Simon, Simon Peter, the Lord changed his name to Peter, but Peter had been walking with the Lord, been part of the ministry, been part of the campaigns, been part of all of that. And, and, and Jesus begins to tell them that things are going to begin to transpire. And Peter doesn't like to hear this. And, and, and he says, Simon, the, the devil has desired to sift thee like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, amen. So that means that, Paul, that Peter, all through the campaigns and all through the ministry, he wasn't yet converted. He was not yet converted. And here's what Brother Bram says about this. In 1960, he says, you're not converted until you receive the Holy Ghost. The Bible said so. After Peter had been been saved and sanctified, given power to cast out unclean spirits and to preach the gospel, Jesus plainly told him he was not converted until he received the Holy Ghost. And he said, after you're converted, then strengthen your brethren. That was on the night of the betrayal, that he was not yet converted and no man is truly converted until he's been changed and died to himself and the Holy Spirit is control of that person. So now... Uh, uh, conversion is very, very interesting now when we see what the prophet says to repent, amen, to change your understanding and be converted, amen, to turn. What are we turning to? Well, we're turning away from everything else. We're turning only to one thing, and that's God, but we're going back to our originality, amen, because that's what the new birth does. It brings us back to our original seed. In 1964, in the message, Why I Had to Be Shepherds, he said, and when you're born again, it isn't just because you believe. You say you're born when you believe. But the Bible said the devil believes also. Now notice, it's not that, it's not that, it's an experience. Now Brother Branham is very consistent in this, that, that the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the new birth is an experience, amen? And, and, and it's and Brother Bam explains it so many different ways, and so many people have explained it so many different ways, but he boils it down to this, from if I could just make it as simple as I can understand how to make it, it's the experience of a changed life. That there was a power that came into you and changed you from what you were and to something else. You've been born again by the power of God and you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, amen? It's the experience of the new birth. That experience of the new birth can have all kinds of other experiences or sensations that go with it, amen? And even Brother Brenham said the mystery in the end time is the mystery of the baptism of the Holy Ghost without sensation. Now, Brother Branham's not saying there'll be no sensation or, or that in the last time you only have the baptism without sensation. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there's a mystery here coming out of the Pentecostal age, coming into the bride age. We have to understand that because the Pentecostals believe that there must be a specific sensation and namely speaking in tongues, amen, that you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost unless you have this sensation. But Brother Branham's saying the mystery in the end time is the baptism of the Holy Ghost without sensation. It doesn't, it's not tied to a sensation. It doesn't require a sensation. It's not vindicated by a sensation. Amen. The initial evidence isn't a sensation. That's what he's teaching us. 
But are there sensations? Many, many times I say there's sensations. Many of us have experienced sensations in the baptism of the Holy Ghost as something begins to change us, as, as we come in contact with another life, another power, another force. Sometimes it's very tangible. Sometimes it's very physical. Sometimes there's gifts that begin to operate. But it can also come so subtle that you don't have a sensation that you pick up in the flesh. But you must have an experience. There must be an experience where where you experience a change. Where you experience a new birth, where, where something in you has shifted, amen? It's not what it was, amen? You, where you can say, I'm not what I ought to be, I'm not even what I want to be, but I'm sure not what I used to be, amen? amen. Something in me ha- has taken hold and something inside of me has changed and now there's another power that's beyond the power I used to have because, because when the Holy Ghost comes, he'll do you with power to be his witness. Amen. That's power to live the word. That's power to manifest. That's, that's the power to live a Christian life. Amen. Amen. I remember as a boy growing up in the Pentecostal church seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I, I mean, I saw a little bit of everything I think that you can see. I've, I've stood and cried and cried and cried. I've had people shake my jaw and tell me to repeat something over and over again while they shake my jaw to try to loosen my tongue. I mean, that's what they say. They tell you to repeat a phrase over and over and over again. I don't think on the day of Pentecost they had to do any of that. I think it was a natural outflowing of the Holy Ghost. I think it was the power of God, not the workup of a man. Amen. But I would be so discouraged and so disappointed because... I, I even remember going to a meeting one time and I got to the front and I stood there and, and, and they went down and prayed for him and, and nearly everybody up there was slain in the spirit and when I opened my eyes and done praying, I was about the only one standing. And I thought, I am a failure. <laughs> but one thing I could never do was pretend. One thing I can never do was fake it, amen? That's something in me I couldn't just go along. I remember being, I remember being down at the altar in what would have been almost described, uh, I hate to use these terms, but almost described as a mosh pit as all these kids were bouncing around and bumping into each other. And my stepbrother started bouncing up and down and jumping up and down. And my cousin and my stepbrother, I heard him tell my other cousin, I mean, these are close, close, close people to me. And he says, just start jumping. It feels so good. And they started jumping, amen? Amen. And it changed their life. What? Not one degree closer to God. When they left that meeting, they were exactly the same as they had always been. Amen. And I couldn't make myself jump up and down. I just stood there and watched. And I felt like a failure. But then I came to the message. And I come in contact with a living Jesus Christ. And something happened to me, amen? Something happened that I knew. Something happened that was tangible. Was there sensations? There was loads of sensations. There was times his presence would come so near that my skin would, would, would my, the hairs on my body would stand on end. I was coming in contact with the living, present, real life, Jesus Christ. And many times I'm reluctant to, to share my experiences because I do not want anybody to say, if that happened that way, it's got to happen this way to me. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to happen the same way for anybody. What's got to happen is there's got to be a power that comes in and quickens the seed of God that's in the soul, amen, and brings a change in our life. But there must be an experience, amen. There has to be an experience that actually changes us. Amen. I knew nothing that I experienced at an altar call in Pentecost changed me. I had no power to overcome. I could not resist temptation. I couldn't overcome lust. I I had no power. And the older I got, the more discouraged I got, the more worldly I got. But this change, this, this experience, I could overcome what I could never overcome before. 
I began having victory upon victory, more victories, and, and it began to change me. And it wasn't a put on, it wasn't a pretend. And there was temptations, and some temptations were hard to resist, and some were worse than others. But there was another power. I wasn't depending on human will anymore because my human will could only hold out so long before I collapsed. And now there's something holding beyond the human will, beyond my strength. When I was collapsing, something else was holding me up. Amen. Amen. And any time that I would begin to fail or falter or, 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 or do wrong, there was something that brought me to an immediate quick repentance and would actually cause me to expose myself and confess and do things that I never did before. I always hid. Now there's another power that's causing me to confess and to repent. There must be an experience. The experience. Brother Ram's consistent in this as he goes through the message, especially in the last few years. It's the... It's the experience of a changed life. Now, we could probably testify all night and how it was for you and how it was for others. And some will have distinct things that they remember. Some will have periods of time of change. Some won't be able to describe it very well. It'll be subtle. It'll be powerful. It'll be all kinds of different things. Amen. And we're not here, amen, to try to make one form or another form or one sensation or another sensation a preferred or better. Even no sensation is fine with me as long as there's a change. Amen. Amen. And so we're talking about repentance and being converted and being converted as being born again. In the Smyrna Church Age, out of the Church Age book, Brother Bam says, now then, here we are coming to a conclusion. As the eternal Logos, God, was manifest in the Son, and in Jesus dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and that eternal one was the Father manifest in flesh, and thereby gained the title of son, even so we, eternal in his thoughts, in our turn, became the many-membered spoken word seed, manifest in flesh. And those eternal thoughts, now manifest in flesh, are the sons of God. Even as we are so called, we did not become seed by rebirth. We were seed, and therefore were reborn, for only the elect can be reborn. So tell me who can be converted. Right. Amen. Amen. Only the elect can be reborn because we, because we were seed is the reason we could be quickened. And non-seed, there is nothing to quicken. He told Peter, when you're converted, Peter was, a, Peter was believing. Peter had a revelation. The revelation in Peter was, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. And he got that from the Father. He believed Jesus was the Messiah. He followed the ministry. He did all that. He says, but yet you have to be converted. And Brother Bram tells us that conversion was the new birth. And he goes on to tell us that only the seed can be reborn. So I ask again, who can be converted? Amen. In Matthew 18, let's look at this. It gives a whole new understanding to the term born again Christian. Because only the seed can be born again Christian. Amen. Sometimes when we say these things, it, it upsets so many people, but we're not here to upset anybody. All we're here is say what the prophet said. There's a living reality. And when we say this, we're not saying there's no hope for anybody else. We're not saying that nobody else will be saved at the white throne judgment. We know that multitudes will, will give entrance into eternal life. We thank God for that. But we're dealing with the reality of the new birth. Amen. There must be a seed there for there to be a new birth. And if there's a seed there, then you're the predestinated seed gene of God. You're the elect. You're part of the bride. So the new birth, who are the, who are the born again Christians? The born again Christians can only be those who can be born again, who can be born again? Only those who have the seed of life. Amen. Amen. Matthew 18, 1. At the same time came, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and sent him in the midst of them and said, verily I say unto you, except you be converted, this means to turn, and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
What's he saying? We're going to turn. What sh- which direction should we turn? What is this turning? If you need to be converted. You need to turn. Turn to what? To one of these little children. You need to, he's speaking of the new birth. You need to become a child again. Amen. Amen. You need to turn to be converted and become as, a little, as little children or you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. This is what he tells Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him at night and he says, uh, uh, he says, he asked him, how can I be saved? Basically. And that's John 3, 1. He says, there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto the rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man do these miracles that thou doest except uh, God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Is that right? So what do you have to do to see the kingdom of God? You've got to be born again, and then you'll see it. Why? You'll get the eye salve. You'll begin to see it. Amen? You must be born again. So when we look at, at, at uh, Matthew 18, verse 3 again, unless you're converted and become as a little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So what is this turning to? What is this conversion? When we turn back to God, when we go back, we must go back to be like children. We must go back to be born again. Because when we go back and we're born again, when we turn back to our origin, when we're born again, we reconnect with who we really are. We reconnect with our origin and we have a new birth, amen? We start over again. The old life is now dead to us. Now there's newness of life. What have we done in our conversion, amen? We have surrendered our life and we now have a new life and now we're starting from the beginning as a child. And what is a child? A child is somebody who doesn't know anything, doesn't have it figured out, isn't proud and arrogant, isn't leading themselves. We go all the way back to say, I'm starting over. I don't know anything. God, you've got to teach me everything new again. This is what it means to be converted, amen, to become like one of these little children, amen. Hallelujah. This is what had to happen to the apostle Paul. This is, this is what had to happen to Peter, amen. Peter was so proud. Peter was so self-confident. Amen. Peter was so sure. Amen. Because God had promised him the keys and and he had got the revelation of who Jesus was and he had cast out demons and he had done all these things. This is what Brother Bram tells us. But he had not yet been converted. And in his pride, he's looking for who's the greatest among us. And in his pride, he's trying to exalt himself over his brother. In his pride, he's rebuking Jesus saying, surely this thing won't happen to you. What is he? He's self-sufficient. He's proud. He's knowledgeable. But what does he need? He needs to be converted and be like a little child again. Peter needs to get to the place where he says, I don't know anything. I'm a failure. I can't do it. Amen. I tried. I got to go back to being a little child, a little baby again. Because Jesus says, I thank you, Father, that you've hid this from the wise and the prudent, but revealed it unto babes. Why? Because the revelation are going to come to the children. And when we're converted, we're going back and starting life over. Doesn't matter for 10 doesn't matter if we're 100. When we're converted, we're going back and starting life over. Everything we had learned is foolishness. All the education we had is worldly. And we're going back to being converted. Amen. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at a few scriptures associated with this. First Peter chapter one, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Because what is the corruptible seed? That is our first birth. Our seed was, our natural seed was corruptible. It's been corrupted through hybridization. So not being born again, being born again, not a corruptible seed. This is what Nicodemus said. Must I go back into my mother's womb a second time? No, that would be corruptible seed birth again. Not born again, born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. 
What's the incorruptible seed? It's the seed gene of God. The new birth is not going back to the corruptible seed again. It's the incorruptible seed. And how is the new birth going to come? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. When the word comes, amen, it's going to give us the ability to be born again. Amen. Let's go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. This is Titus 3, verse 4. After that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. This washing of regeneration, regeneration means new birth, reproduction, renewal, recreation, regeneration. That's what that word means. Then the, the, the next word there, renewing, means renovation or a complete change for the better. So what has the Holy Ghost done for us? It's made us a new creation, completely changed and better. Amen. That's the new birth, amen? That's what the new birth has done, amen? It, 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 it is by the washing. It, you know, he says, not by works of our righteousness, which we have done. We couldn't do this. We couldn't earn this. But according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration. What? Making us a new creature. Amen. Re, being reborn or rebirthed. Amen. And being fashioned, renovated, made completely better and completely different. Yeah. Now it's an actual new life. Amen. Amen. That is the renewal. This is the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Brother Ram says in the identified masterpieces of God, I was reading this the other day and it really struck me. He said, and as Jesus said one time, consider the lilies. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one. Now he's going to take this analogy that Jesus used and he's going to explain something to us. He says, Solomon in all his glory was a magnificent sight. There's no doubt he was a great thing to the world and a great man before God, but Solomon's robe did have no, didn't have no life in it. It was a piece of material probably sheared off of a sheep's back, but the lily had life. What we need today is the life of Christ inside of us. That's what purifies, not the outward, a turned around collar or a degree of psychology or something. It takes the power of the resurrected Christ to make us what we should be. God has no other plan than let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in the church. Amen. That's God's plan. Amen. Consider the lilies. Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed as one of these. Solomon's array, amen, was man-made. It was magnificent. It was beautiful, but it was man-made. But the lily, amen, had beauty that came from inside. There was the life of the lily. And now in Christianity, we're not to be, have a put-on glory, but an inside-out glory that comes from the life of Jesus Christ in the believer. Amen. So let's go back to Luke 22. Let's pick up Peter's story. Luke 22. In verse 60, Luke 22 and verse 60. Jesus had told him, he prayed for him that his faith fail not. He said, when you're converted, go strengthen the brother. Then we know on that fateful night that the guards came, Peter and all his, his glory cut off the ear of the high priest because he was trying to defend the Lord. Actually, he was trying to defend his own self and his own belief. <clears throat> and he followed them into the, uh, into the house of the high priest where they were having the trial he was in the outer court, and they kept asking him if he was a Galilean, and he kept denying the Lord. And here we come to the last time in verse 60, and it says, Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And Matthew, it says, he curses and swore. I know not what thou sayest. 
And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I think this is so important, a scripture, for tonight especially. Peter, he was a child of God. He was predestinated seed of God. He, he loved the Lord. He genuinely loved the Lord. He went along with the ministry. He had certain revelation, but yet he hadn't been born again. But Peter thought that he could withstand temptation. Peter thought that he was man enough or Christian enough or however we would say it. He thought he was. But when the pressure came on, he found out that he didn't have anything inside. His will crumbled. His strength failed. His, 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 uh, you know, his bravery was empty. When it came down to it, Peter in himself didn't have what it took to live the life. He needed to be converted. So when Peter realized that he had utterly failed the Lord, he went out and wept bitterly. I think that's the best thing he could have ever done. I think he would go out and weep bitterly because he realized he's failed. All his pride amounted to nothing. All his efforts amounted to nothing. He failed. You know, <clears throat> this might begin to be the first time Peter really starts to be honest with himself. I think it would do us all a world of good to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes we've been in church, raised in church, raised around the message. We know so much, been part of the ministry, part of the campaign. But in our secret lives, we know what we really are. We know what we're not overcoming. We know what vices we have no power to overcome. We know no matter what we bluff and say, no matter what we put on, we know what's really going on on the inside. Sometimes I think the best thing we can do when we keep failing secretly, you know, it's not publicly secretly, keep covering it and failing and covering it and failing. I think the best thing we can do is just go weep bitterly somewhere and say, God, I cannot do this anymore. I'm an absolute failure on my own. I, I cannot. I thought I could, but I cannot. What did he need? He needed to be converted, but he was eligible to be converted because he was a child of God. Amen. And after that Peter was converted, we find out that Peter no longer is hiding in the upper room. He's no longer running away. Amen. Ashamed of the Lord. But after he receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he runs right out and becomes the spokesman on the inaugural day. He's not ashamed anymore to declare his allegiance to Jesus Christ. He was before, but he's not now. What happened? Something changed. There was a conversion that took place. There was a birth that came. Amen. And we find that Peter doesn't even become a perfect believer after that because it's not about flawlessness. Amen. It's about following the Lord. It's about a new birth. And we find him in Antioch, separating from the brothers, creating a dissension. Amen. And, and playing the part of a hypocrite a little bit. And Paul withstands him to his face. Amen. But guess what? Peter's correctable because Peter's been changed. Amen. Peter doesn't cut his head off. Peter doesn't accuse him. Peter doesn't and break fellowship, but later Peter actually admonishes them to believe Paul and actually it, it takes the writings of Paul and makes them equal to scriptures. Why? He wasn't perfect, but he was changed. That was a changed man. And later we find him, amen, Peter is the one who, 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 who was brash, who was bold, who was proud, who was arrogant, who corrected everybody, who wanted to be the best. Amen, when he found out he didn't have the goods, he wept bitterly, amen. He, he, he absolutely changed his thinking about himself. He repented, he realized, I'm not what I thought I was. And then the new birth came. And now he went out. And he never tried to be anything anymore. 
Now, when the lame man was healed at the gate, beautiful, amen, he went lumping, uh, leaping and jumping into the temple, and they gathered around and began to, to almost worship, amen, Paul, uh, Peter and John. Peter and John, John. Peter says, why look you at us as though some power of us has made this man whole? It's not us, amen, but it's faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith in his name that this man is everywhere whole. Peter now has no desire to take the credit. He's a changed man, amen? That, because why? Because he repented and he was converted, amen? His thinking changed, he was converted, and he comes out different. This is the man, amen, that God would allow to preach the stature of a perfect man and the virtues of God. Amen? I would not have called him eligible before to preach on temperance or patience or brotherly kindness. But the new birth changed him. He was renewed. He was renovated. He was regenerated. Amen. He was a new creature. He went back to being a child. He went back to being a babe. Amen. He went back to knowing nothing and starting all over again and going from the, from the new birth unto adoption. A new life. Starting as nothing. The Apostle Paul thought he was a believer. The Apostle Paul thought that he knew the word, been to the best school, and he thought he was working for the Lord. He was the smartest, he was the wisest, he had the most skill and ability. He was in good standing with the priest and the high priest and the elders but he had an encounter with a living Jesus Christ and the pillar of fire. And that encounter smote him to the ground, humbled, humbled, and broken. He finds out that the one that he had been persecuting, he thought they were people that had a false religion and a false idea and were ruining the, the Bible. When he come to find out in that encounter that he was persecuting Jesus Christ himself, who was living in those people. And now his whole world changes, amen? Does he come to repentance? He absolutely comes to repentance because his whole thinking changed. When he gets up from that experience, he can't even see to walk. He has to be led by the hand into the city. And when he's led by the hand into the city, the Bible says he lays there for three days with no sight and no food. I wonder what he thought about for three days. I wonder how many things he regretted for three days. I wonder, with this revelation that just hit him, as a literal light out of heaven, changed his whole world, his whole paradigm, all his understanding. And you know, when it all changed, it left him humble and broken. It wasn't flippant. It wasn't, oh yeah, I see that, I'll take, no. It wrecked his universe. That's why Brother Bram says in one place, I doubt a dry-eyed confession. It's not that you have to cry to be converted. That's, that's not what he's saying. But back in his day, there were so many decisions for Christ and raising your hand if you agree and you want to be saved and, and, and fill out a card or come forward and repeat after me prayer. Amen. But there was, there was none of this brokenness, none of this weeping bitterly, none of this realizing I'm not what I thought I was. I thought I was a Christian, but I'm not really a Christian. I thought I was a message believer, but I see now I'm not really got the change that I was projecting to other people because inside I have no power to overcome. That's not something to take lightly. That's not something to move on beyond. We don't keep pretending. We don't keep moving on in our own pride. Amen. We need to come to a weeping bitterly. We need to come to a place when we're flat on our back, broken and humiliated with a couple days to think about it. And I'm sure he was thinking about, how could I have been so wrong? How could I have missed it? And I'm sure he was thinking about Stephen Stoning. Amen. Amen. 
Sometimes what we need is to realize we're not what we thought we were. And we need a bit of humility and brokenness and some weeping, some contrition, some quiet time to sit and say, God, you've got to help me because I can't help myself. What we don't need to do is just keep moving on and hope everything works out. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, it says, in, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. This is why I believe the prophet said, I doubt a dry-eyed confession. Like I said, I don't, I don't want... I don't think you need to pour out floods of tears just to prove that you've confessed. But you may. But I believe one thing, there'll be a conviction in your heart that'll tear you up. There'll be something to cause you to realize, I gotta have more than what I have now. There'll be something that begins to wreck your world. I mean, I've seen it even, even in children. I've seen when they begin to go through that time where they're just unsettled and they're disturbed and something's eating at them and it's tearing them up. What is it? Amen. There's, there's godly conviction that has come and there's a sorrow and there's a concern for their soul. I don't think that should ever go away. I think we need genuine, real conversions. Amen. We need to have our world wrecked. We need to weep bitter tears. We need to realize Amen. I need something that I don't have right now. Because what I have right now isn't working. And we need to cry out to God and say, God, you made a promise in your word that if I will repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of sins, I shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I have been baptized according to your word, and I have repented, and I'm repenting now. All my understanding is changing. God, come and fill me with your spirit. Change me, almighty God. Do the work in me that I can't do myself. Do in me what my willpower has failed, what my strength has failed, what my intellect has failed to do. Do something in me, Lord. I invite you, I ask you, I implore you, God. Change me. I think it should be serious. It should be earnest, not flippant and lighthearted. But there should be some earnest repentance. Brother Bem says in the message, the token, he said, don't just come this far and say, I believe the message. You obey the messenger, come into Christ. You say, well, I believe every word said, Brother Branham, that's good, but that's just being able to read. He's not talking about a genuine faith from your heart. He's talking about a mental acceptance of what you've heard or been taught. But that mental acceptance is not enough. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You should. You should recognize it to be true. You should accept it as true. Amen. But it's got to go deeper than a mental acceptance. Amen. Or an agreement. He said, that's just being able to read. He said, take the message Take it into your heart that you must have the token, amen? The very life that was in Christ be in you. When I see that, I will pass over you. Until you have the token, you're not safe from the pending destruction, amen? The pending destruction's coming, but the only safety is the token, amen? In, the, in, in, on the, in Egypt, amen, at the Passover, the token was the literal blood that they put on the lintel and on the doorpost, and, and, and the death angel would pass by and recognize that token is symbolic, amen, that they have taken the lamb inside and they slain the lamb as a substitute for them. And the token is evidence that they're safe, amen. that they've obeyed the word and they're sealed under the token. Mother Bam said the token today is not physical blood. The token today is the life that was in the blood, amen, the life that was in the blood, that, that, that blood that was shed at Calvary, the life was released and the life now can come back upon the believer and that life in us, that's the thing that changes us, that's the thing that quickens us, that's the new birth, that brings us back to our origin and starts us as a child again on the road to adoption. 
And that token, that changed life, that literal life of Jesus Christ in the believer is the token and will keep us from the impending judgment. And it's the only thing that will. But praise God, it's for the children of God. It's absolutely for the children of God. Brother Branham said God wants to fill you more than you want to be filled. It's his desire, it's his plan, it's his word, it's his promise. Amen. What does he need? He needs somebody who will repent. He needs somebody who will lay themselves out and say, God, I can't do this. I'm not going to pretend another day. I need the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost to live this life. I need a new birth experience. I need an experience that changes me. That's what he needs. That's what we need. That's what we all need. And you know, even those of us who've received this experience, sometimes we need to turn back again. Sometimes we wander away a little bit, make a misstep here or there, pick up our own idea about something. Sometimes we need to make a turn back ourselves. But the man refers to this, and, and Jesus mentions this in the Revelation chapter 2. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. This is the Ephesian church age. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. This repent is the same word repent, change your thinking. The Ephesian church, he says you've lost your first love. What was their first love? That first experience they had. When everything was fresh and new, they were committed to God and in a relationship with the Lord. And Brother Branham said formalism began to creep in. Men, they, they, they had lost their zeal and their fire and their ability to reach forth in the spirit and a little bit of formality had begun to creep in. Is that right? And he tells them, you've left your first love. Now repent and go back to the first works. Oh, this isn't just for a new conversion. This is for all of us, friends. Sometimes we, 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 we think we're okay and everything's going along fine, but in reality, we've begun to grow cold, amen? We've begun to grow a little formal, and every once in a while, he needs to tell us, repent and go back to your first works, amen? When you were first born again, when the, everything was about Christ and nothing else. When nothing else mattered, when rejection didn't matter, when the rest of the world didn't matter, the only thing mattered is that something's changed in me. I've met God, and that's all I want. Amen. 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 He says, repent and do the first works. What does he mean? Repent and go back. And Brother Bram says in the fourth seal, he says, look, she was asked to repent and go back to where she fell from. And where did she fall from? The word. Hey, where did he fall from? Where did the denomination fall from? The word. There you are seeing no other way, just every time it's come right back to the word, right back to the word, and they get into a system that runs them back away from the word, runs them from the word instead of to the word. Notice, look, she was given a space to repent, go back. Repent means to go back, turn back, about face, repent, go back. Brother Branham is now taking this term repent and he's using it in this, in this way according to the scripture, repent and go back. I mean, we know repentance in the Bible means change your mind. Conversion means to turn back. And now he's coming to the church who's already the church, but he's saying turn back, amen? Repent and turn back. Say, God, help us to not lose our first love. Help us not to lose our first experience. I say, God, what I want is I want a freshening of my experience. I want a fresh relationship that stays fresh. 
I don't want it to grow formal. When I feel it growing formal, I want it to come right back, amen? I want to go right back to when you, you feel the Lord so close, you know he's there, amen? I want to go back to that. I want to, I want to stay in those refreshing times. I want to be refreshed again and again and again. I don't want to just preach this for new people to be converted, amen, and, and turn to the Lord and born again. Amen, after I've had the experience of the new birth, I don't want to stray too far away from it, amen? I want to stay in the refreshing of the Lord, amen, and, and walking in him in my first love. If it goes 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and we go mature all the way into adoption, I don't want to leave leave my first love. When it's so real and so powerful and it means everything to us. Praise God. Amen. I just want to finish with this Scripture that I quoted before. But Jesus said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Who's he revealing himself to? His babes. The ones that can be born again. Not the ones that are all self-sufficient and wise, have the message all figured out and has all the answers. But he reveals it to the babes. Those that have been turned back and become like little children so that they can see the kingdom of heaven. Those that have been born again so that they can see the kingdom of God. That's who he's revealing this to. We don't need to get self-inflated, proud. We don't need to become know-it-alls because we've believed 20, 30, 40 years. What we need is to keep laying in the presence of the Lord and saying, Lord, change my thinking. Change my thinking. Change my thinking. You know, I, I, I come in contact with a living Jesus Christ so many years ago, 24, 25 years ago. And for 24, 25 years, however long it's been, he's been constantly changing my thinking. You know what I've been doing for 24 years? I've been repenting. For 24 years, I've been repenting. And I don't think my time of repenting is over. But I want his mind in every situation, his mind, in every decision, his mind, in everything. I don't want to repent just once and be converted. I want to keep repenting and keep repenting and keep repenting. And anytime I find myself straying away and getting cold, I want to turn back, amen, and get right back close to him again because that's the only place that I'm happy and that's the only place I can survive and that's the only place I can grow. Amen. We have to repent and be converted. Be turned back to a child again, to be born again. Repent. It's a commandment. Repent and be converted. Let's all stand together. Musicians, if you can come, Brother John, if you can come. I just had a desire to do a little word study because I want to understand what it means to repent and be converted. We can come and we can ask forgiveness. We should ask for forgiveness. We should confess our sins. We should ask for forgiveness. But real repentance goes beyond that. It actually changes our thinking. It takes us from remorse and sorrow for sin and remorse because godly sorrow worketh repentance. Because when you're really sorry about something, you change the way you think about it. When you really regret the way you've lived and you regret your misunderstandings and you regret your selfishness and you regret your pride, It changes the way you think about yourself. Peter, I'm sure, had a lot of changing to do in his thinking. Paul certainly had a lot of changing to do. I know I had a tremendous amount and am still repenting. But I want to repent and I want to be turned back. I want everyone, every child of God to have the opportunity to repent and be turned back. 
Repent and be converted. Go back. To be born again. Go back. No, it doesn't matter how old, old you are, and it certainly doesn't matter how long you've been in the church, and it doesn't matter how long you've been in the message. Repent and be converted. Let's be born again. Let's have that experience where you can say, I, I may not be able to explain it. It may not have happened to me the way it happened to you, but one thing I'm sure of, there's been a, an effective change in my life. Something real has happened to me and changed my life. Amen. Amen. Let's just bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, I trust you, Lord, in all things. I trust you, Lord, in your leadership, in your Holy Ghost anointing, Lord. And I trust, God, that you directed me to preach this message tonight because I trust your leadership. I trust your ways. I've seen you work so many times in so many ways. It's always been perfect, Lord. When you take control, it's always perfect and always effective. God, this message might only be for one soul. I only one soul under the sound of my voice that needed to hear this. But if that's true, you directed me for that soul. God, if you've given me the anointing to preach it, I pray that you bring the anointing to receive it, Lord. That you would touch that life, that you would touch that soul. God, no matter where that individual has been, that seed's been laying there from before the foundation of the world. You've been waiting, Lord, for a time you can quicken it to life. Maybe the individual who's carrying that seed has been playing church, pretending, going with the motion, caught in the stream and flow of life with parents or loved ones or spouse. Maybe they've just been carried along through the church and they have no objection to the message, but they, they know inside of themselves there's never been that change, that new birth, it really gives them the power, even in their secret life, to overcome. God, I pray if there's an individual that's like that, Lord, I pray that you'd go to them now. For God, you said through the foolishness of preaching, you would save sinners. You would save the lost, Lord, through this mechanism, and I trust that it'll work according to your ways, Lord. God, I pray that you would move in the hearts and lives of your children that you would bring genuine repentance, genuine conversions, Lord. And God, for all of us, Lord, who had a tendency to grow cold, Lord, we wanna turn back. All of us who've let the cares of life and the responsibilities, frustrations begin to bring a formality to our, our walk, our life. God, would you forgive us now? God, awaken us, Lord, so that we can change the way we think so that we realize everything's not fine, it's not fine. It's not the way it should be, it's not the way you want it, Lord. And bring us back to our first love. God, give us the power as we surrender to you, I pray you give us the power, Lord, and a freshening, bring a freshening upon us, Lord. Freshen the experience, freshen your spirit, pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, and bring us back to a fresh experience with you where we can have a love affair, Lord, that's fresh and vibrant, Lord, and powerful. God, forgive us. God, I pray that there would be none of us, Lord, who would leave here the same way we came in. But God, that your working of your spirit would begin to move in our hearts. We'd begin to change us and break down barriers, Lord. And God, I pray above all that you would, that you would send the power of conviction upon hearts who are not being honest. That you would send the power of conviction and bring a sorrow for sin. Bring a remorse, Lord, so you can break through the barrier of religion, break through the barrier, Lord, of tradition, and get down, Lord, to where your seed is laying, waiting to spring to life. And I pray, God, that you would remove every barrier and you would go to that seed and that you would bring it to life now, Lord, that you would do a quickening work. God, we love you with all of our hearts. We thank you, God, because we never came looking for you, came looking for us. You, we, we never had the power to change ourselves, but you came and changed us. You have the power, and you've given the power. You've promised the power. 
Lord, let the promise of your word take effect tonight. Move in our hearts and move in our lives. Change us, oh God, we pray. We ask these things, Lord, just move. Move like only you know how to move, Lord. I pray that you sweep in waves from row to row, from seat to seat, until you don't leave your seat untouched, Lord. That you would find it, that you would, you know exactly where that seed's laying. I'm asking, Lord, that you would, that you would bring it to life by the power of your spirit. I love you, God. I thank you, Lord, that you care so much about us that you would move the ministry this direction. That this is your love, Lord. This is your desire for your own. This is your call to yourself, Lord. May, may it be recognized as a call to come to your side. It would be those who would leave, Lord, their own thinking and own tradition and run to you, Lord, to embrace you and lay themselves down and be changed. We love you, God. We ask that your power would unfold in our lives. Give us a change in our lives and give us the power to live your life. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Can we sing that song, Sweep Over My Soul? You know that, Sweep Over My Soul. Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. an evangelist. It's not my gift. I'm not requiring that you raise your hand, come to the front. If that's what you need, that's what would help you. Come and pray. Pray at your seat. Move out of your seat. But for me, I'm not requiring that. All I'm asking is there's a transformation in the heart of God's children. There's a new birth experience that changes from somebody that's been trying. Somebody who's been desperately trying and failing, trying and frustrated, trying and don't know how. My desire as a pastor, my desire as a brother, my desire as your friend is that the sweeping of the Spirit would sweep down and bring a transformation. Tell us not a trying, but a relinquishing your efforts and surrender. From a trying and failing to a giving in completely to God and saying, God, I can't go the cycle of trying and failing anymore. I need you to break the cycle in my life by your spirit. And I encourage you, don't be hasty. It's Wednesday night. I know it's Wednesday night. Many of us have obligations and places we've got to go, but you know if God's dealing with you. You know if you need something more. You don't need me to pull you. You don't need me to make you do some action. You know yourself. Don't be hasty. Well, God has given an invitation. Well, God has extended himself and he's reached out his hand. Don't be hasty tonight. As we sing, just, if you need more, just open yourself for more. If you need that experience, 
Tell God you need it. Be absolutely as honest as you know how to be with God. Be exactly where you are. He knows where you are anyways. And it doesn't matter what anybody else in this room thinks about you or thinks where you are. What matters is what God knows about you and what you know yourself. Don't be hasty. But if you need more, open yourself and say, God, I believe you preached this message for me tonight, and I'm going to receive it as from you for me. Change my life. God bless you. Let's sing this again, Brother John. Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. Hey.